what's your take on what's going on in Gaza? We had a lot of things change since this conflict started. I think what most needs explanation is why has the United States so rapidly accumulated such massive military force in the area? You know, we, we have um, aircraft carrier strike groups. We have large numbers of uh, American uh, fighter jets, B-1 bombers. B-1 bombers are nuclear capable. We have a, an airborne division. We have Marines, special uh, forces, troops. We've got uh, uh, an, an uh, Ohio-class uh, nuclear submarine, which is armed with nuclear missiles. It, it's an amazing assemblage of military force, and it clearly is not intended for Hamas. This type of, of force is not what you need uh, with Hamas, and furthermore, it's not Americans, it's not America's war. So why are we there with this tremendous force? That's the question. I haven't seen any real analysis or discussion of this other than of my own uh, speculations about it. And it's very puzzling. Um, why is it there? Uh, when you have such a serious situation going on and no one raises the serious questions, things can uh, uh, you know, certainly get out of hand in, in unexpected ways. And uh, the world is not uh, uh, ready for that. So. That, I think, is uh, what uh, needs to be addressed. Why is this amazing American military force present? What's your speculation on this tremendous amount of weapons and forces that were sent to Israel, to the Middle East? I think that it might be the American neoconservatives seeing an opportunity to reopen the Middle Eastern wars. The whole intent of the Middle East wars that began with George W. Bush uh, was to overthrow Syria, Iraq, and Iran so that the suppliers of the Hezbollah militia in Lebanon uh, would be moved aside out of the way. And so the militia in Lebanon would have no financial or uh, support or no one to supply it with weapons. And so the Israelis could then try a third time to occupy southern Lebanon, where they uh, covet the water. They want the water there. So it looks to me like um, either the neoconservatives had advanced warning of the Hamas attack and knew that it would lead to um, a serious situation, or they quickly saw that and got and got the forces there. But they're there, I think, with that intent of reopening the Middle East wars and Syria and Iran are the targets. I, I believe they may have been relying on Israel's treatment of Gaza to bring in Hezbollah. That would then be Washington's excuse to go to the defense of Israel and the wars could be renewed. So far, it seems Hamas and Iran have not taken the bait. So the neoconservatives or Israel may create a false flag attack and blame Hezbollah or Iran. And so I think that is a danger and people should be talking about it in order to deter it from happening. If you say, hey, this could happen, this could happen, it kind of makes it difficult to have a false flag attack if people are predicting that such a thing might happen. So, but they're not. And so the chances of this spiraling into a much bigger war are wide open. How do you see the reaction that is coming from the Arab states, from the Shia, Sunni? We have Iran, Turkey. Well, they're very uh, angry, but there's been no real uh, intervention. And uh, 
it may well be because uh, the Russians are discouraging it. I mean, it could well be the Russians understand that this is ripe for a big explosion into a wider war. So it, the Russians, I think, are restraining the Arabs, but uh, the Russians cannot prevent a false flag attack. If Israel or the United States uh, wants to have a false flag attack to justify enlarging the war, there's nothing the Russians can do about it. So I think um, it, it would be better if uh, the Russians were more forcible forcible in, in how they speak about this. And uh, it might help to tear the false flag attack. So I, I'm kind of um, concerned that this is going to get out of hand. It just makes no sense for such massive American military forces to be there much less nuclear armed submarines and B-1 bombers whose whole purpose is to carry nuclear weapons. To have that there is just a sign that there's high danger, really high danger. There's some much wider intent than Gaza. Why the Netanyahu administration tries to push the population from the northern part of Gaza to the southern part? Israel itself has answered that question. It's not a question of my opinion. It's just a question of what Israel says. And Israel says it's going to drive all of the Palestinians out of Gaza into the Sinai Desert, and that Israel is going to build tent cities there and supply food and water and rely on the West and the United States and Jordan and Egypt and other countries to take them in as refugees. So, in other words, Palestinians will be eliminated from Palestine. And I've seen reports that there are already Israeli attacks on the Palestinians in the remnants of the West Bank. There's not much left of the Palestinian West Bank. It's now largely Israeli settler settlements. So, um, if the world can't do anything about uh, driving 2.3 million people out of Gaza into the Sinai Desert, they're not going to do anything about the West Bank either. Are they going to be able to send all of these people to Sinai? Is that possible in your opinion? Yes, but remember again, I don't think this is just about Gaza or Palestine. If it was just about Gaza or Palestine, there wouldn't be any need for American aircraft carrier task force, American divisions, nuclear submarines, fighters, jet uh, uh, B-1 bombers. I mean, this is uh, far beyond uh, Gaza or Palestine. So there's something bigger going on in uh, Washington's head and in Netanyahu's head than merely Gaza. So focusing on Gaza is like wearing blinders. It's like the blinders on a horse. There are bigger things, I think, afoot. We should be worried about the bigger things because if the bigger thing is an attack on Syria and Iran, then Gaza is not, is not the main story. The world so far has proved impotent to do anything the uh, UN resolution was vetoed by the United States, and Israel has said it doesn't uh, care what the rest of the world thinks. And uh, clearly, the United States has not imposed a ceasefire on Israel. Uh, President Biden won't even ask for a ceasefire. He just asked for uh, a humanitarian break uh, for a few hours or a few days, I can't remember which, <clears throat> so that some water and medicines can be put into Gaza. Uh, so there's nothing stopping Israel but Hamas. And so the question is, uh, how does Hamas stop Israel when Israel bombs from the air and Hamas has no air defense system? So it seems the Israelis would be able to just keep advancing the bombing southward 
until they're all driven out into the Sinai. But once again, I and, and this, I think, is an Israeli goal. Um, I think they prefer that to trying to engage Hamas with their own army because the casualties for Israel would be high. But it doesn't cost the Israelis casualties to bomb them from the, from the air. So I think that that plan can succeed because the world has shown it can't do anything. The United States has not done anything to stop it. And the propaganda here is all on Israel's side. And the Israeli atrocities are not emphasized. It's Hamas's atrocities, which appear to be largely made up because <clears throat> the Israeli newspaper Heretz has actually reported that many of the uh, Israelis who were under Hamas control report they were treated very uh, humanely and uh, they weren't mistreated. And, Hamas, and the uh, Israeli newspaper Haaretz also reported that many of the Israeli hostages, uh, initial hostages inside Israel, said that the deaths of the Israelis was caused by the Israeli government's attack on Hamas, because they were all in the same buildings. Hamas had the Israelis, they were in, this, in the buildings, and that the Israeli government, or not deny you, they just made the decision to destroy everything in the building in order to get Hamas. And so they sacrificed their own citizens. And so the Israeli newspaper Haaretz said that most of the Israelis were killed by Israeli military action directed at Hamas. So it's not even clear we had these alleged atrocities. Let's talk about Mahmoud Abbas. How do you see him? What's his role in this whole conflict? I don't think there is a role. The reason Hamas is there is because uh, no one else would stand up for the Palestinians. And clearly, uh, no one else has. So there's nothing left in the West Bank. There are little pinpoints, uh, little villages. Many of them, they're not even connected. The, if you look at the maps, current maps. The West Bank is largely gone. It's Israeli territory. The settlers go in and they drive the Palestinians out of the villages and put up apartment houses. So there are Israeli organizations that try to prevent that, uh, but they haven't succeeded. So uh, I don't think there is any role for anybody else. Hamas is the only political force the Palestinians have. And <clears throat> <clears throat> They're the only ones willing to make any kind of resistance. So Anthony Blinken says that he's thinking of two-state solution. How do you see this? If there are some dots on the map for the West Bank and we have this Gaza Strip, how are they going to have a state out of these dots in this strip? How are they going to connect these regions? Well, obviously they can't. You see, the two-state solution has been the excuse of Washington and the Western world and the United Nations not to do anything about Palestine. They always say, oh, this two-state solution. This has been going on since when? <laughs> Forever, decades, probably longer than you've been alive, probably longer than your life, the two-state solution. It's a fake thing, they say, so they don't have to do anything real. They talk about, oh, the solution is a two-state solution. There's nothing left of Palestine to make a state out of. The only solution would be to simply declare an Israeli-Palestinian state, and the Palestinians would have equal rights to the Israelis, <laughs> and they would have to learn to get along together, but all of these restraints and restrictions and terrorism of Palestinians would have to stop. Well, it's clear that the Israelis are not going to share the land with Palestine. So they're not going to do that. You know, Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, encouraged that idea. And they ended up calling him uh, an anti-Semite. So uh, he wrote this book, you know, 
uh, what was it called? A peace, not apartheid. And something like that. And uh, all of the uh, Jewish members of the Carter Center resigned. <laughs> so there's, there's nothing uh, can be done because Israel relies on time and force. Time and force. You know, they take some and everybody complains and they wait a while and then they take some more. And they, well, this time they intend to finish it, to take all of it. But once again, the focus is wider than Palestine. The focus is greater Israel from the Nile to the Euphrates. That's the focus. And who is in the way of greater Israel, Syria, Lebanon, Iran? So that's the danger of this, because that's where the war becomes regional and worldwide. And it's a war that would be very serious for Russia, because uh, once the United States has Iran, it has endless access into Central Asia, into Russia herself, and in go all the terrorists and the jihadists and, and everything else. And uh, it's a much greater threat uh, to Russia than Ukraine. So you see the focus of the neoconservatives is completely away from Ukraine. It's now in the Middle East because they can get back to their real goal. You have to remember they overthrew Iraq. They started on Syria, but Putin stopped them. He sent in the Russian Air Force before we could do anything. And then we gave up in Afghanistan because we couldn't defeat the Taliban. So that brought the overthrow of the entirety of the Middle East to an end. Well, now is a chance to reopen it. And so I think right now the new conservatives are just waiting on Hezbollah to come in. And then we rush to the defense of Israel. And if Hezbollah doesn't come in, there's a chance there'll be a false flag. And then the false flag lets us rush to the defense of Israel. So those are my concerns. Uh, time will tell. Uh, but I think people should be aware that these are possibilities and they should be talking about it because if there's awareness in advance, it's hard to have a false flag because when it happens, people will say, see, it's what we said. And then it doesn't work. Then the accusation is you had a false flag to start a war. It's not, oh, the poor Israelis were attacked again. How do you see the possibility of Turkey getting involved in this conflict? Is that possible in your opinion? Uh, Turkey won't get involved unless it becomes a regional conflict. Despite the anger in Israel, I think there's a reluctance of the Arabs to get involved because they see we're, we're there and will use it as an excuse to widen the war. And they won't be fighting Israel, they'll be fighting us, looking forward to that, and is restraining them. And so nobody will do anything. And so, as I said, that's likely to result in the neoconservatives or Israel having a false flag attack on Israel that then lets the United States go ahead with the wider agenda. So that's the danger. It's not, oh, will Turkey do this or somebody? That's not going to happen. What, what do you want to have a new conflict in the Middle East? What's the main goal of this new conflict that they're looking for? I told you, it's greater Israel. Just greater Israel. Nothing else behind that. Well, the neoconservatives are closely aligned with Israel. They always have been. Some of them are joint Israeli citizens. 
And for the Zionist, which is a, an old and powerful Jewish movement, Zionism, uh, the greater Israel is the goal. That's what they want. And, and so if you're saying, well, uh, what about some American oil interests? Are they in and, and, and things like in the military security complex? They like wars because they can sell weapons. Yeah, all that's true, but that's not what this is about. This conflict is not because the American oil companies want the oil. And it's not because uh, the military security complex wants to sell weapons. Of course, they want the oil. Of course, they want to sell the weapons. But that's not the cause of the situation. They'll take advantage of the situation to achieve their ends. But that's not the cause of the situation. The cause of the situation is Israel twice tried to occupy southern Lebanon. They need the water. Twice Hezbollah drove them out. The decision was made, well, who supplies Hezbollah? Where do they get the weapons? Where do they get the finances? Ah, Iraq, Syria, Iran. Oh, okay, we take them out. It's a war on terror. So we created the war on terror. And we used the war on terror to take out Iraq. And we were going to take out uh, Syria. Obama was about to invade Syria. Remember, he crossed the line. He used chemical weapons against his own people, blah, blah, blah. We're going to invade. Well, the next morning, the Russian Air Force was there, and we didn't invade. So that stopped the whole project. Well, now is a chance to come back. What he was claiming about chemical weapons in Syria, that was a false flag operation? Of course it was. Everybody knows it was a false flag. Of course it was. But still, it's got nothing to do with us. It was just an excuse that we were going to seize on. It was our false flag. So, you know, it's just a question of being realistic and seeing the big picture. There has to be something... There has to be some reason for the massive American military force presently in Israel's vicinity. It can't possibly be Gaza or Hamas. So there has to be some other reason. What is that reason? I gave you one that occurs to me. Maybe you can think of another. Maybe there are better reasons. But it's certainly not to protect Israel from Hamas. <laughs> or to protect Israel from Hezbollah. Why do we need nuclear submarines and B-1 bombers to protect Israel from a militia? So there's something else there, something else going. There's a, an agenda, an overriding agenda. It's not declared, but it's obvious to me. It may not be obvious to anyone else. Nothing is deterring Israel from its attack on civilians. I mean, mainly they're killing women and children. You know, there's a question that there's a hospital there with babies in incubators. And Israel says, we're going to bomb it, get out. Well, how can they move babies in incubators? <laughs> how? I mean, and the world is accepting it. In fact, all the Western governments are cheering it on. The Republican Party in the United States is cheering it on. It's actually the Democrats who are trying to resist it a bit. And the reason is the United States is now a multi-ethnic country. It's a Tower of Babel, and there are plenty of Arabs here, and they are aligned with the Democrats. So the Democrats can't really turn on their own constituency that they have built. So they are the only ones who are seeing anything. And there's really not much they can do because the neoconservatives control foreign policy. And we know what their agenda is, it's greater Israel. They've made this clear for decades. It, Norman Podhoritz wrote it in the Jewish intellectual magazine commentary long before 9-11. He said, we have to take out all these Middle Eastern countries. He named them. 
And then, then, and then the same countries he named showed up on the memo that General Wesley Clark was shown in the Pentagon, the same country. Seven countries disappear in five years. That was the goal. And it was on its way until the Russians stepped in Syria. How are they going to manage that? It's not possible for the U.S. How long they can stay in Israel to keep protecting Israel? I don't think they're there to protect Israel. They're there to expand Israel. The question is, uh, have the Arabs, through their inaction to date, already lost the initiative? If they had acted before all this armament from America got there, then they would be more likely to succeed in defeating Israel. Uh, now, it, it involves going to war with the United States, not going to war with Israel. This is a big difference to the minds of the Arabs. Um, and Israel has already said that they'll nuke them, that Israel will nuke them, which admitted that Israel had nuclear weapons, something they've long denied. <laughs> well, if, if they think Israel will nuke them, they may think we will too. Otherwise, why do we have the nuclear submarine sitting right there? You, you see, it, it, the whole situation changes, the formula changes. Uh, we've made it clear, I think, that uh, the war will be with us. So does the coalition hang together? I don't know. I have no idea. It's, it remains to be seen, but you have to just come back again. Why is all that American force there? It has to be a reason. And the reasons they give don't make any sense. So now the agenda may not come off. It may fail. But the fact that it's possible is scary because it would be a very dangerous war. It would clearly bring in Russia and probably China. And so it would be a really serious situation. And it shows that the neoconservatives and the Israelis are willing to take those dangerous risks. They're very dangerous risks that are being taken. Why? It's not over Gaza. So let's shift the gear to the Ukraine war. Is the Ukraine case already dead for the U.S. foreign policy? How do they see the Ukraine war, the Ukraine conflict right now? Well, it's over. The Ukraine was a way of causing trouble for Russia, okay? And it's played out. The Ukrainians are devastated. They don't have any army left. All the weapons we sent them didn't do them any good. And uh, there's no one left to fight. And But now the neoconservatives see a much greater opportunity to cause Russia trouble. The Middle East... Syria, where Russia has a commitment, if, if they knock, if, if the United States and Israel can knock Iran out, well, they can funnel jihadists into uh, Central Asia, into Russia herself. There can be all kinds of troubles, constant troubles for Russia. Uh, so this is a bigger opportunity for the neoconservatives to cause trouble for Russia than Ukraine ever was. But anyhow, Ukraine's done. It's over with. They're finished. They can't do anything. They've just lost half their population has left the country. The armies are bled to death. They're talking about, you know, trying to... Uh, conscript whole men to go fight. So, you know, that, that's over and done with. It's, the focus now is where they can really cause Russia trouble, lots of it. And, and uh, one would think Russia would know that. And if so, how can they stand for it? And so the situation is dangerous.
It's simple. It's dangerous. It's really not an argument. It's a dangerous situation. Why Lloyd Austin at the Senate is asking for more weapons and funds to be sent to Ukraine, in your opinion, if they already know that the case is dead? It's just something you have to do. He also knows he isn't going to get the weapons. So it doesn't mean anything to ask for them. And everybody knows there's no point. What, what, what good have any of the weapons done? They've not done Ukraine any good. They just got more Ukrainians killed. So, see, the Russians don't, have, don't need to make an offensive. They got what they wanted, Donbass. And the Ukrainians have shown they simply cannot attack successfully. It, it simply decimates their troops. So the Russians say, we don't need any casualties. What do we want to go invade all of Ukraine for? We got what we want. We got Russian Donbass. We came in here because these were Russians being mistreated and we stopped it. So they're content. There's nothing we can do about it. We can give them all the tanks in the world. The Russians are going to keep blowing the tanks up. So that's over. The UN Secretary General, Anthony Guterres, was talking about ceasefire. Why the UN doesn't function? What's the problem with the UN, in your opinion? It can't function because the members of the Security Council have vetoes. And the United States is not going to let anything happen to Israel's agendas. You know, you have the UN, but it, it can pass resolutions. But it takes action by the Security Council to inst instigate or institute any kind of real action. And we sit there and veto anything that Israel wants us to veto. So as long as the United States is uh, serving Israel, the UN can't do anything. And it can express the world's outrage, but it can't harness the outrage to any action. So that's that answer. And, uh, but, you know, and if it's something the Russians were doing and we were trying to get action, they can veto it. And the China can veto it. Any member of the Security Council can veto. So as long as you go by the rules, there's nothing can be done. With this conflict in Ukraine and right now in Israel, we have this differences between Turkey and other members of NATO. We have these problems that are getting worse in Europe. I think that um, Europe, the European countries, I don't think they any longer have a nationalist memory. I don't, I don't think they are any longer sovereign states. They're, they're not only under American, uh, Washington's thumb, but they're under the EU's thumb. And so they really have surrendered this sovereignty, both to the EU and to Washington. So they don't have an independent foreign policy from Washington. They don't have an independent economic policy from Washington. And they, can't, they don't even have their own money. The EU, uh, the euro, is a multinational money run by a central bank that's not answerable to any European government. So they're not sovereign. They're not a sovereign people. So it, it, they almost don't mean anything any longer. So NATO, it's just the way uh, we marshal support for our agendas. They're captives. And so it makes it look like we have allies. And the rest of the world has been accustomed for a long time to the dominance of the Western countries. You know, since when? Since the Turks were stopped at, at the gates of Vienna in the 1600s, the West has ruled the world. And so 
the, wor the rest of the world is still that idea in its head. And it makes the West more powerful than it really is because of the idea that's lived for so many centuries that the West determines the world. Well, that's ceasing to be the case. Of course, it's ceasing to be the case, but it takes a while for ideas to weaken and fall away and get replaced. And that's in the process. The rise of Russia and China is obvious. And that they are constraints on the West is obvious. So the change is occurring but it just doesn't happen like that.